Good evening, Jerry. Good evening. Nice to see you. Good evening, Miriam. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brian is is not here. Actually, he took his brother out for his birthday. Oh, so, that's right. Yeah. And he's just back. He uh, that's our friend that we met, but she prefers to remain anonymous because uh, I, I can explain it later. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so this evening we are going to, I, before I, I begin, I was explaining a little bit about what we do and how important it is when we read God's word, we read it for what it says, not for what other people say it says. Uh, sadly, many religions reinterpret, add and take away from the word of God. Um, so this, this week's portion is called Chukat Balak. Chukat is, comes from the word Chok, which is a, an, an ordinance a regulation that we don't really understand. It's like when you're young and your parents tell you to do something and you say, why? And your parents say, because I said so. And that's it. God says it's because I said so. Mainly, there we may try to figure out the reasons, but some of them are just too high. We're living in a three-dimensional world, which we do not understand. So imagine the fourth dimensional world, which is impossible for us to understand. So there are things that God is showing us and wants us to obey. And the second part is Balak, which was the king. And this king wanted to curse Israel. So I'm going to share the screen and we're going to begin reading in the book of Numbers. Hang on, let me just move here. Let me see. How do I get rid of this one? You know, it may be easier to read it from here. Oops, what happened to me here? <laughs> ah, here we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to be reading a little bit about uh, something called a red heifer. And I'll explain a little more as we go. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron this is written in Old English, so I'll do my best to change it to the language that we can better understand. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, who were brothers. This is the statute. Here it says, Chukat HaTorah, the statute of the Torah, which the Lord commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to bring you a red heifer. A red heifer is a female cow, a young cow. It's female. And they say that it's, it's choosing a red heifer to reverse the sin of the golden calf, which we read um, we read in, in our last um, portions. Uh, it, it needed to be faultless. It couldn't have any marks on it. It needed to be perfect. When you bring something to God, it has to be perfect. There's no blemish. And upon which never came a yoke. So it was a young, a young cow. And they, she hadn't ever had to work. She was innocent. And you will give her to Eliezer, the Cohen, the priest. And, and she shall be brought outside the camp. And she shall be killed before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of her blood with his finger, sprinkle her blood toward the front of the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting was the place where that was built in the center of the people where God would meet with them and speak to them. And they had to meet seven times. The heifer shall be burnt in his sight. Her skin, her flesh, her blood, her dung shall be burnt. And the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet, and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Now, this is a story. The, the, the idea of the offerings, again, were because the all the pagan religions would make would do sacrifices to their gods in appeasement 
our God didn't immediately remove the sacrifice, the sacrificial system, but he was slowly going to imitate it, have us do the same, many of the same things, but the focus would be different until he could remove it because he didn't want us to sacrifice any of his creation, not of his animals, and certainly never human beings. Whereas in pagan religions, they would offer their children, they would burn them on the, on the fire and offer it to their gods, which was an abomination to our God. And it says here, the priest, which in Hebrew is hakohen, will take cedar wood is the tallest, again, Hebrew is a picture language. So we have the understanding of the cedar wood being the tallest of trees. Hyssop are the smallest of bushes. It would be used for sweeping the floor. The cedar word, the cedars were the highest of the trees. And scarlet was a color that was symbolic for justice, according to our rabbi called Rambam. And cast in the midst of the burning heifer. God wants us to go from our pride to humility. He wants us to live with humility. This is a picture of that. Again, we read the stories, but we always have to stand back and say, okay, what does this mean for us today? So the priest will wash his clothes, bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards he can come into the camp and the priest shall be unclean until evening. So he's going to burn this red heifer, take, wash his clothes, and he's going to be unclean, which doesn't mean physically unclean. It's spiritually unclean. And the word is for is tame. And tame has to do more with um, not being able to approach God because of maybe stress or because things we've done that we don't feel we have a right to come to approach God. Now, the one who burns the red heifer is to wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in water, and he shall be unclean until the evening. So the red heifer was meant to cleanse the person but by getting in contact with the red heifer, which is to cleanse them, they become unclean. And I'll explain a little more about what our rabbi talked about this, this principle. A man who is clean, who is presentable, shall gather up the ashes of this heifer, lay them outside the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel, to do, to sprinkle water as a purification from sin. He who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And it shall be to the children of Israel and to the stranger who lives among us. So it was always Jew and non-Jew, Israelite and non-Israelite who walked together under one God. For both of them, it would be a statute forever. Sadly, religions have changed that. And they say, this belongs to these people. This belongs to that people. But our God never wanted that. He always wanted one statute, one Torah for all nations. Now, the idea of the heifer, the red heifer, um, the one who touched the red heifer, which was meant to make them clean, they would become unclean. Now imagine, how do we apply that to our lives today? And this is the story that our rabbi told us. Let's say you have a friend who is going through a terrible time. They're really, really suffering, really struggling, and they don't know how to deal with them. So they call you up and you sit and this person unburdens himself on you. And you become heavy with the, that burden, although it makes the burden lighter for them, the burden becomes heavier on you. And then you need to find a way to lift up this burden from you, but you've helped your friend. And now you're able to go to God 
and be cleansed of some of the heaviness that was put upon you. That's the idea of the red heifer. He who touches the dead, any dead body, shall be unclean for seven days. And it's not because the dead is dirty or filthy that makes you unclean. It has to do on the spiritual level. Remember, this is a hook. These are hukim. They are things that we don't really understand, but we have to accept them because this is what our God tells us. So, and he, what he's trying to show us here is that he is the God of the living. And when we come near somebody who's dead, there's a heaviness, a sadness that comes upon us, especially when it's someone who is very close to us. And, and when we go into that kind of mourning and that kind of sadness, we don't feel that we're able to approach our God. So we have to take some time off and we purify ourselves for three days and seven days, and then they shall be cleaned. But if he doesn't purify himself the third and the seventh day, he shall not be clean. Whoever touches the dead, even the body of a man that is dead, and pure, doesn't purify himself, he has defiled the tabernacle of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So God, when, when, when he says cut off from Israel, it's like it, God has given us a picture that we're part of a body, a body of people, and we're cut off from them. It's like when you leave home and you're cut off from everybody, you feel very empty and you could become very sick. And that's why it's important to be with people, to be with community so that we're not cut off. In this case, it was Israel. Here they are in the desert and any soul that is cut off would die in the desert. That God is showing us how important it is not to cut our, ourselves off from community because the water of sprinkling was not sprinkled against him. He shall be unclean. His cleanness is yet upon him. This is Zot HaTorah. This is the Torah. This is the instruction. If a man dies in a tent, everyone who comes into the tent and everything in the tent shall be unclean for seven days. I believe that this is probably where they get the idea of the Shiva. When we, when we see someone in a tent, it's usually in our family. That's when we go into a tent. Um, and and any, anybody else who comes into that same tent, it's like your home. They shall be unclean for seven days. They need to take a break for seven days before they can go and present themselves to God. That's, to me, what this means, what this is saying. Every open vessel which has no covering, flows bound upon it, is unclean. Whoever in the open field touches one who is slain by a sword, or one who dies by itself, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean for seven days. Again, it's a spiritual understanding that may not be clear to us, but this is what God is telling us to do. And he's reminding us he is the God of the living. And for the unclean, they shall take from the ashes of the burning of the purification and running water. A clean person shall take hyssop again, a very humble plant. Dip it in water, sprinkle it on the tent and on all the vessels, upon all the persons that were there and upon him who's touched the bone or the slain or the dead or the grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day, the seventh day. Again, he's, this is a ritual. And I won't continue to read it because there's so much more to read. And basically the principle is the same. It's, it's talking about how we were at that point in time to cleanse ourselves. Today, we cleanse ourselves from our dead by sitting Shiva for seven days. We take time to remember, time to unburden ourselves to people who come and be with us. And the children of Israel, 
even the whole congregation came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people lived in Kadesh and Miriam died there. Now, we're jumping in this chapter 38 years later. We're going to be seeing how Miriam was not able to enter the, the land because of something that she did. Moses would not be entered the promised land and neither would Aaron. So the people loved Miriam. And it said there's a, there's a teaching, which is in the Talmud, that wherever Miriam went, the rock would follow her and water would always be given to the people. And now she was buried and it says, and there was no water for the congregation. And they assembled themselves against Moses and against Aaron. These were the two who were leading the children of Israel through the desert toward the promised land. The people fought with Moses and spoke, oh, we should have only died with our brothers if we had perished them before the Lord. This is the next generation that is going to be going into the land. So the first generation was perishing. Why have you brought us this assembly into this wilderness to die here, we and our cattle? We were constantly complaining, no matter how much, how many miracles we saw, no matter how much we knew that God had protected us, we were constantly complaining. And today, we need to be careful. We need to be careful because each of us has a tendency to forget the good things in our lives, to see our lives as half empty, instead, the glass is half empty instead of half full. And God is the one who provides everything for us. And the more we give him thanks, the more we obey him, the more he will provide for us. And we will be, and we will live with joy. And they said, why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Imagine the land of milk and honey, they are calling an evil place. It's not a place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. And now when they say this, it's absolutely opposite to the truth. Because when the scouts went to scout out the land, they came back with all kinds of vegetation. Took two men to carry the branches of grapes. They were so full. And they said, it is indeed a land of milk and honey. And now they're accusing Moses and Aaron again. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting. <clears throat> and they fell upon their faces. And the kavod, the glory of God, appeared to them. I can't imagine what that's like. But we know that it was shining. There's something just shone there because God is spirit and he's light. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, assemble the congregation, you and your brother, and speak. Look at this. Listen to what he says. Speak to the rock before their eyes so that it will give forth its water. And you shall bring forth to them water out of the rock so that you shall give the congregation and their cattle to drink. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the people together, the assembly, before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, are we to bring you forth water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rod, the rock with his rod twice. And water came forth abundantly, and the congregation drank and their cattle. But look what God told them to do. God said to him, speak to the rock. He didn't tell him to hit the rock. And not only that, but Moses said, are we, in other words, Moses and Aaron, are we to bring you water out of this rock? 
keeping God completely out of this equation. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me. The word in Hebrew here, lo ha'emunatechem. Emuna in Hebrew is faith. Because you didn't have faith in me. The word to sanctify here is hakedosheni. To sanctify me, to separate me from all the other gods. Because there is only one God. All the nations, all the tribes who lived in that part of the world all had their local tribal gods. And here this invisible God who dwelt in the fourth dimension was saying to them, you didn't believe in me. You didn't separate me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I had given them. So Moses and Aaron, who led our people out of Egypt all through the 40 years in the desert, were now not going to be allowed to enter the promised land. We need to be careful when we do not trust in our God. We need to beg God to help us, to help us build, take our faith that he's given us and build it into trust that he knows the best for us, that he's always with us. These are the waters of Meribah, where the children of Israel fought with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Now, Ed, who is Edom? The Edomites come from Esau. We have Abraham and married Sarah, and they had a son named Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah. She had, and Rebekah had twins. Her twins were Jacob and Esau. Jacob became a, a child of the Israelites to form the people of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, Isaac. And Esau became an enemy, an Edomite, even though they were twin brothers. One became a, a, a Jew and one became a Gentile. Same parents, twins, same family. It has nothing to do with our birthright. It has to do with our heart, who we choose to believe in. Do we believe in the gods, the many gods on this earth, or do we trust in the one God? This says your brother Israel. You know all the hard work, the travail, the, the, the difficulties that befell us. How our fathers went down into Egypt, and we dwelt in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians were terrible with us. And <clears throat> they made us slaves and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and he sent, here it says an angel, but the word is a malach, which could also mean a messenger. And to me, the messenger was Moses. And he brought us out of Egypt. And behold, now we're in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of your border. So they're at the at where Edom, where the Edomites were living. And they said to the Edomites, to the king, let us pass, I beg you, through your land. We will not go through your fields or through your vineyards. We will not drink any of your water from your wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn to the right or to the left until we have passed your border. And the Edomite said to him, to them, you shall not pass. It reminds me of the Lord of the Rings. Thou shalt, you shall not pass unless I come out with a sword against you. So the children of Israel said to him, but we will go by the highway. And if we'll drink your water, I and my cattle, 
then I will give you, we will pay for it. Just let us pass. Our feet, throw on feet, we will not do you any harm. And he said, you shall not pass. And Edom came against them with many people and with a strong hand. Thus, Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. So Israel turned away from him. And they journeyed from Kadesh. This is the next part of their journey. You're going to be seeing here all the places that they went. This was over the 38 years, the next 38 years, after they left Mount Sinai, where they received the Ten Commandments. And the children of Israel, they journeyed from Kadesh, the whole congregation, and came to Mount Hor. And the, children, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, now imagine, Aaron, listen to what it says. Aaron, this is the brother of Moses, who was the high priest of the, of, of the Hebrews. Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my word at the waters of Meribah. We just read that. Take Aaron and his son Eliezer, Bring them up to Mount Hor and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on his son, Eliezer. And Aaron shall be gathered to his people and shall die there. I can't imagine what Aaron must have felt like going up onto the mountain, knowing that he was going to die. He was going to be taken. And Moses did as the Lord commanded. And they went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments, put them on Eliezer, his son. And Aaron died there on the top of the mount. And Moses and Aaron came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they wept for Aaron for 30 days, even all the house of Israel. This was the custom of, of um, that they had learned in Egypt. But we sit Shiva for seven days, but we mourn for the first 30. Now the Canaanite, remember the land that God was giving the Israelites at the time, there were many people already living in that land, but they were tribes. They hadn't really it wasn't given to them. They were just living in that land. That land belonged to the God of Israel. The Canaanite, the king of Arad, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel came by way of Atarim, and he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. And they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And the place of the name of that place was called Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea, by way to the Red Sea. Um, it's called the Red Sea in English. Why? I'm not sure. Because in Hebrew, it's Yam Suf. It's the Sea of Reeds. It should be the Reed Sea. To encompass the land of Edom, which was the go around Edom. And the soul of the people became impatient because of the way. It was hard, this trip. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. We didn't learn. When we do not learn, there are consequences. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no water. And our soul hates this light bread, which was the man, the manna that God had provided for them in the desert. So look what the consequences were. The Lord sent fiery serpents. Hanashim, 
serpents of Esh uh, from um, fiery serpents. These were serpents that, that bit them. They bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. There are consequences for our disobedience. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. They recognized it. And the word for sin is chatanu. We say that at Yom Kippur. Chata'anu, forgive us our sins. We have spoken against the Lord and against you, Moses. Pray to the Lord so that he takes away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, look, what, look what's going to happen here. Take a fiery serpent. Make, not take, sorry. Make a fiery serpent. In other words, to cast it out of bronze or out of brass. Set it up on a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone who was bitten, when he sees it, he shall live. The serpent that had caused it to die, that same symbol is being placed on a pole. And, and when all they had to do was look at it and they would live. How is that possible? When Moses made a serpent of brass, set it upon the pole, and it came to pass that if a certain, if a certain serpent had bitten any man, when he looked on the serpent of brass, he lived. Doesn't make any sense. What God is showing us, it has nothing to do with the serpent on the pole. It had to do with the obedience of looking up. The one who had faith, the one who listened to what Moses had said, whoever looks up at the serpent on the pole shall live. Christianity has taken that to refer to Jesus on the, on the cross. Whoever trusts in him shall live. But in this case, the serpent didn't die. The serpent wasn't killed and put up on a pole. It was the one who obeyed God and looked up to, to what he was told to do. The same exact thing when we were in Egypt. And we were told to put blood on the doorpost and the angel of death would not kill the firstborn in the house. Whoever obeyed would live. God was slowly getting our people to be obedient to simple tasks. Do this and I will save you. It has nothing to do with a human being saving another human being. That's all made up religion. It has to do with trusting what God says to us. The children of Israel then began to travel. Now we need to remember how difficult this was. What we're going to do is we're going to be going through all the different places over the next 38 years where they had journeyed. And every time they journeyed, they would remember there were 12 tribes. They had to, everybody had to take up their tents. They had to undo the, the, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle in the center, pack everything up and then and bring it all um, bring it all with them. And they would continue their journey. They journey from a boat. They pitched at Ye Abarim in the wilderness in front of Moab. Moab was another relative. This was one of the two children of Lot when when um, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. So they went to Zered, and then they went to um, Arnon, and they went to Vaheb in Sufa, and the valleys of Arnon. They went to the Ar, and to Be'er, to, to, uh, which is a well where the Lord said to Moses, gather the people together, and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song, spring up, O well, sing to it, the well which the princes have dug, which the nobles of the people, uh, they dug with the scepter, with their staff, 
uh, they delved into them. And from the wilderness, they then went to Matana, from Matana to Nahaliel, from to Bahot, from Bahot to the Valley of Moab, to the Pisgah. And they looked down upon the desert. Now they're coming to the, the Amorites. Other, now, who were the Amorites? Let me see. I know I made... Uh, da -da -da -da. I'll find it later. Anyway, let, and they say to the king of the Amorites, let me pass through your land. We will not, they said the same thing as, as before. We will not turn aside into the field. We won't go into the vineyard. We won't drink waters from your well. We will go by the king's highway until we have passed your border. And Sihon would not allow Israel to pass through his border again. But Sihon gathered all his people and they went out against Israel in the wilderness and came to Yehaz and he fought against Israel. And Israel destroyed him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from the Arnok to the Yabok, even to the children of Ammon. These were all relatives, but they would not allow them in. And the children of Israel took all these cities and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites in Heshbon and in all the towns thereof. You see, they had asked peacefully. They were just going to pass through. And they weren't given the, even the common courtesy because everybody was afraid of them because they had heard all the things that the, their God had done, what they had done to the Egyptians, what they had done to the other kings. And they were afraid. Let me continue on here. I just want to go down because this is all going to continue where they're continuing their trip. They turned and went by the way of Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them. He and all his people to battle at Edre. And the Lord said to Moses, do not fear him. For I have delivered him to your hand and all his people and his land. And you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon. So they killed him and his sons and all his people until there was none left remaining and they possessed the land. Now, I know that people who would be reading this maybe for the first time may wonder, what kind of a God is this who allows Israelites to go in and kill all these people? But we have to remember that these people were worshiping false gods. And some of the things, the paganistic rituals and the rites that they were doing were so evil, were so disgusting. They, they, the way they treated their women the way they treated their children, the way they treated their animals. There was no mercy. And our God is a God of mercy. And sometimes the only way to do it is to wipe them out. It's like, like when you have a cancer growing in your body, sometimes the only way to remove the cancer is to cut it out. And that's what God was doing. And now we're going to come to the second part of the portion. It was called Hukat Balak. Now we're going to come to the, another king. The children of Israel journeyed. Um, Jerry, would you like to read some? And the children of Israel journeyed and pitched in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was overcome with dread because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now will this multitude lick us up all that is round about us as the ox lick it up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab, 
at that time. And he sent messengers unto Balaam, the son of Peor, to Pethor, which is by the river to the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. So we see here that there's another king. He was the king of Moab, who was again, as I said, a relative of Israel. But they had become enemies out of jealousy. And Moab went to the Midianites. Bilam, who was this Balaam, was a prophet of the Midianites. And, and he had heard about this prophet, King Balak. So he went to him, and this is what he said to Balaam. Okay, continue. Come now. Yes. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom thou blessed is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. Okay, hold on a second. So here we see the character of Balaam, who was a, a prophet from Midian, and he had a reputation. And everybody knew that whoever Balaam blessed was blessed, and whoever he cursed was cursed. And what does it mean to bless, to bless someone, to be blessed? For me, it means to come under God's protection. To be cursed is to go outside God's protection. So somehow God allowed this man who was a Midianite, he wasn't an Israelite, to be able to do that. Okay, continue. And the elders of Moab, and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came upon Balaam and spoke unto him the words of Balak. Okay, hold on a second. So we see here, they, they left with the rewards of divination. They used something called divination, which is speaking to the spirits, speaking to the dead, looking for messages. These were practices of the pagans whereas god wanted direct communication with him and they can't be at the rewards meaning they wanted a higher balam to do what they want they wanted a higher balam to curse israel okay go ahead and the elders of moab and the elders of midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand and they came unto Balaam and spoke unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you back word, as the Lord may speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. So here Balaam is going to stay. This is what Balaam said to these men who, who approached him. Stay here tonight, and I'm going to bring you back word, because he knew God would speak to him. Okay. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Sippor, king of Moab, hath sent, me un sent unto me. Behold, the people that is come out of the Egypt, it covereth the face of the earth. Now, come curse me them. Peradventure, I shall be able to fight against them and shall drive them out. Okay, hold on. So here we see Balaam says to God, no, um, God said to Balaam, what men are, are these with you? Do, don't you think God would know? If God is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful, all-wise, he's, omni he's omniscient. Why would he, God say to Balaam, who are these men with you? It reminds me 
of when God said to Ab to Adam when he had sinned, where are you, Adam? All he wanted to know. Balaam could have said immediately, could have admitted what, what was going on. You're going to see what Balaam does, how he speaks out of both sides of his mouth. Because he, what he's saying is, these people are asking me to curse them. And maybe I will be able to fight against them and drive them out. Okay. Continue. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. You shall not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. They are blessed. They are covered by me. I am protecting them. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. So easy. Go home. The Lord is not going to let me go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. And Balak said, sent yet again princes, more and more honorable than they. And so they he's came sending, to Balaam. He, hold on. He's sending even more. It, the word isn't honorable, but more distinguished people with more money he's going back he's not giving up he's he's going back to Balaam because the men came back and they said he's refusing to come with us they're going to bribe him with even more and they came to Balaam and said unto him thus saith Balak the son of Zippor let nothing I pray thee hinder thee from coming unto me for I will promote thee unto very great honor and whatsoever thou sayest unto me, I will do. Come, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. So look what he's, look what this Balaam is being offered. I will make you the highest role in the land. You like, you can be second to Pharaoh. And whatever you ask me, I will give you. Just come and curse the people. And what does Balaam say? And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do anything small or great. Isn't that great? Here is this non-Israelite who is saying, Even if the king Balak would give me a house filled with silver and gold, I can't go against the word of the Lord, my God, to do anything, small or great. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will speak unto me more. What is this all about? He already says he can't do it. And now what's he saying? You know what? Wait a minute. Wait here tonight. Let me ask him again. Maybe he'll change his mind. Because he's he smells the gold and silver. He's a prophet for hire. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men are come to call thee, rise up, go with them. But only the word which I speak unto thee, thou shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord placed himself in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. So he decided to go. He went, he got up in the morning, he saddled his donkey and went with the princes. And God was upset with him because God knew his heart. He knew he had never had intention to just turn, or, turn away from the, for all that money. And, the, and then look at this. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. God sent an angel with his sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam hit the donkey to turn her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow way between the vineyards and a fence being on one side and a fence on the other. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord and she pushed herself 
against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall and he hit her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrower place where there was no way to turn either right or left. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord and she lay down. She just lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was so much that he hit her. He hit the donkey with his staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. And she said to Balaam, imagine the Lord allowed a donkey to speak. What I have done to you? What have, what have I ever done to you that you have hit me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you have mocked me. I would, that there, if I had a sword in my hand, I would have killed you. But the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey upon which you have ridden all your life to this day? Would I ever do anything to hurt you like this? And Balaam had to say no. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand and he bowed his head and fell on his face. You know, in our Bible and in life today, I have heard stories of this angel of the Lord and the, and the angel of the Lord who has his armies of angels who we cannot see. But there are stories in our Bible where and our, our armies were coming against the Israelites. And there was no way that we could have win. We could have won. And the enemy suddenly saw these angels and they just took off and they said, didn't you see? Couldn't you see all those angels? I, I believe very strongly in that, that these angels protect our people. When the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you hit your donkey three times? Because I have come forth as the adversary. Because your way, you are going against me, contrary to me. It's interesting because here, look, here it says adversary. And in the Hebrew, look at it says, Satan. So we know it's not literally the devil, but it's, it's an adversary. That word Satan can be uh, the adversary. And the donkey saw me and he turned aside three times. Because unless she had turned aside, I would have, I would have killed you and saved her. And the lamb said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. Again, hata'ati, hata'at, I have sinned. For I did not know that you stood in the way against me. Now, if it displeases you, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men. But only the word that I will speak to you shall you speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. And when Balak heard that Balaam was, had come, he went out to meet him. On, to Ir Moab, which is, which is the city of Moab, on the border of Arnon, which is like a valley in the uttermost parts of the border. And Balak said to Balaam, did I not sincerely, earnestly send you, send unto you to call you? Why did you, why didn't you come to me? Am I not able indeed to promote you to honor? And Balaam said to Balak, listen, I'm, I'm coming to you. Have I now any power at all to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that's all that I can say. And yet he keeps doing it. He keeps going. Maybe he's hoping that God's going to change his mind. Balaam went to Balak and they came to Kiriat Huzot and Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes. And it came to pass in the morning that Balak took Balaam and brought him into Bamot Baal and he saw from there the uttermost part of the people. 
And Balaam said to Balak, build me altars, prepare me seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bull and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, stand by the burnt offering and I will go and perhaps the Lord will come and meet me. And whatever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went to a bare height and God met the lamb and said to him, I have prepared the seven altars and I have offered up a, a bull and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balak and this is what you're going to say. And he returned to him and lo, he stood by his burnt offering. He took up his parable and he said, from Aram, Balak brings me, the king of Moab from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me. Come, destroy Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I destroy whom the Lord has not destroyed? From the top of the rocks I see him. From the hills I behold him. It's a people that shall dwell alone, shall not be reckoned among the nations. We as a people were to, were to be set apart and not counted among the nations. Who has counted the dust of Jacob or numbered the stock of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let mine be the end like his. And Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have blessed them. And he answered, Must I not take heed to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? And Balak said to him, Come, I beg you, to another place. He's not giving up. And he's telling him to curse him again. And they go through the same thing all over again. I'm not going to read it all over again. But look what it says here. Here's another, they're, they're offering again. He took up another parable and he said, arise, Balak, and hear. This is what Balaam is saying. Give ear to me, O you son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. When he has said, will he not do it? And when he has spoken, will he not keep his word? Will he not make it good? Behold, I have to bless. And when he is blessed, I cannot take it back. No one has seen iniquity in Jacob. Neither has one seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord is God is with him. And the shouting for the king is among them. God who brought them forth out of Egypt is for them like the lofty horns of the wild ox. For there is no enchantment with Jacob, neither is there any divination with Israel. Now is it said of Jacob and of Israel, what has God wrought? What has he done with you? Behold, a people rises up as a lioness, and as a lion does he lift himself up, and he shall not lie down until he eats of the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. And Balak said to Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. And Balaam answered and said to Balak, Did I not tell you all that the Lord speaks I must do? I don't know why he keeps going through this over and over and over again. Maybe he thinks God's going to change his mind because this is the third time. And Balak said to Balaam, come, and I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them from, for me from there. And they go through the same thing again. It's shocking. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord, to bless Israel, he did not go, as the other times, to meet with enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. 
and Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel dwelling tribe by tribe and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Ruach Elohim, the spirit of God came upon him. Now this is a Gentile prophet, remember. And the spirit of God came upon him and he took up this parable, this, this uh, story, this uh, something that gives us a moral and says, the saying of Balaam, the son of Beor, the saying of the man whose eye is opened, the saying of him who hears the word of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, fallen down, yet with open eyes. And this prayer that Bilam now says is one that we sing every single Shabbat. Ma tovu, o halecha Yaakov, mishkenotecha Israel. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel as valleys stretched out, as gardens. Here, you read this because you have a, a beautiful reading voice for this, Jerry. What, what line is that? Here, you can read it again from five. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, thy dwellings, O Israel, as valleys stretched out, as the gardens by the riverside, as aloes planted of the Lord, as cedars beside the waters. Water shall flow from its branches, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God who brought him forth out of Egypt is for him like the lofty horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations that are his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces, and pierce them through with his arrows. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a lioness, whom shall rouse him up? Blessed be everyone that blessed thee, and cursed be everyone that cursed thee. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. And Balaam, Balak said unto Balaam, I call thee up to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor. But lo, the Lord had kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spoke I not also to thy messengers that thou didst send unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. What the Lord speaketh, that will I speak. And now, behold, I go unto my people, come, and I will announce to thee what this people shall do, thy people in the end of days. And he took up his parable and said, the saying of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the saying of the man whose eye is open, the saying of him who heareth the words of God and knoweth the knowledge of the Most High, who seeth the vision of the Almighty fallen down, yet with opened eyes. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not nigh. There shall step forth a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite through the corners of Moab, and break down all the sons of Seth. And Adam shall be a possession. Seir also, even his enemies, shall be a possession, while Israel doeth valiantly. Not of Jacob shall one have dominion and shall destroy the remnant from the city. And he looked on Amalek and took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his end shall come to destruction. And he looked unto the Kenite and took up his parable and said, Though firm be thy dwelling place and though thy nest be set in the rock, nevertheless, Cain shall be wasted. How long? A sure shall carry thee away captive. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live after God had appointed thee him? But ships shall come from the coast of Kittim, 
and they shall afflict Ashur, and shall afflict Eber, and he also shall come to destruction. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. So all this, these verses that you are reading were all a prophecy of things that will come. It says, there shall step forth a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So we know that one day uh, there will be a great leader, a star. That's why uh, they believed that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah at that at the time of the when the Romans had destroyed after the Romans destroyed the temple, and they gave him the name the Star. Um, the The Hebrew people are expecting another savior like Moses to to save us from our enemies. Right now, Israel is surrounded on all sides by enemies, and uh, it's been like that with our people from the time that we left Egypt. The, um, the Amalekites were the worst. They, they, they attacked us from the rear, this here Amalek, and they destroyed women, children, the sick. They, they kill with no mercy. Um, God is a God of mercy. We, we can fight against our enemies, but we're not to attack and premeditate murder. <laughs> he allows us to defend ourselves, but we we are not to attack out of with a, a vengeful uh, and greedy and and a need for power like like these uh, religions and politicians of the world who destroy their people uh, for out of sheer greed. God wants us, His people, to live in peace, and one day we are all waiting for this. The savior, we don't know who it's going to be. And Israel lived in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people to sacrifice, to the sacrifices of their gods. So you see, God is taking Israel out of Egypt, out of the, the, uh, the, the slavery of um many gods and and all the things that are associated with those gods and here the midianites the moabites were uh enticing the young men to commit harlotry with the daughters of moab they were beautiful women and it's not so much that they were sleeping with these women the problem was that these girls were bringing them to do to sacrifice to their false gods. And we are not to have any other gods but the one God of the, all the universe. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto the Baal of Peor. This was a god, the Baal of Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them up unto the Lord in the face of the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Here God is telling Moses to kill from our own for those who we're, we're going to destroy all our people, the leaders, the chiefs who are leading us astray. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, slay every one of his men who have joined themselves to the Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought among his brethren, his tribe, a Midianite woman right in front of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the children of Israel while they were still weeping at the door of the tent of meeting. This was sheer arrogance. Moses at this point was tired. He had it. He knew he wasn't going into the promised land. He had lost all his koyach, all his strength. And he, he was not able to enforce what God was asking him to do. 
So here we see Pinchas. It, it says in Hebrew, Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, who was Aaron's son. The Kohen, the priest, saw it. And he rose up from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the chamber and thrust both of them through with the belly of Israel, with the man, with the, through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died by the plague were 24,000. So this is the end of this portion. But we see here, we see how people who become religious can take these verses and turn them into a justification for them to go out and murder their enemies. And that's not what this is saying whatsoever. What it's saying is that Pinchas had a heart for God. And he didn't, he went and he stopped this pri this, uh, these, these two young people who were so rebellious. He stopped his own from and the and the plague stopped in, in Israel in, in Israel. He he didn't go out to the Midianites and murder them. He stayed within the camp and was stopping it from happening within our own people. That's the difference between premeditated murder of your enemies and, and being obedient to what the Lord wanted us to do, which was to stop the, the paganism, the, false, the idolatry to false gods. God was moving us away from the pagan gods of, of those territories and bringing us to only worship one God and obey his, his 10 commandments. So that was, there's an awful lot in this, uh, in this, in these two portions. Is there anything that anyone has to comment or say? Well, just one thing, uh, when you, when you were reading about how uh, <clears throat> the Israelites were talking about Egypt, as the land flowing with milk and honey. Imagine. Really God said he promised them a land flowing of milk and honey, the land they were freed from Egypt to go to. And it reminded me just like I had a picture in my head uh, of people sometimes who would leave, let's say, our congregation or another cong congregation, and they would go to one that had more, let's say, onions and leeks, so to speak, metaphorically, but who had a bigger choir and a bigger this, but didn't necessarily have, you know, the worship of God. So it looked like there were more leeks and more beautiful things. It was a land, a synagogue that was a flowing with milk and honey. Yeah. And yet the real milk and honey is God in our lives. Exactly. So, really, no matter where we are in the world, God is all we need. Wherever we go, if we follow him and his, his commandments, he will provide for us anywhere. I know that, um, you know, I, I left Montreal uh, um, many times because I was very unhappy here. And sometimes we leave our, you know, the place. We have a, a good reason for leaving sometimes. We leave our our homeland and yet all we do is continue to look back because nothing can compare nothing can compare with home and yet really the home is where the heart is so um you know there was a, usually when immigrants come to this country there's usually a reason they leave because things get too difficult for them if everything was so peachy keen they would stay where they were but obviously they're not. We've we've had many people in our congregation come from countries that are are have been brutalized. You know, like um, we have a family who came from Venezuela. Venezuela today is a nightmare to live in that country. Um, you know, there are horrible things happening around the world. But 
these things are happening around the world because the world is shaking its fist at the creator. The world does not want to know about the God of Israel. Um, I was I was watching um, a, a program, and it's and I saw that it's much easier to say, "Oh, we thank the gods," or uh, "Look to the gods." It's easier for us to say that, and nobody will judge you. But if you say, "Oh, I pray to God," or "I looked to my God," you know people get upset with that. They don't like the idea of one God for all nations. That's what people call it now. I hate this term. They say the universe. What's the, what do they mean? You know, that's been going going on for a couple of years now. But people say, well, you know, I guess the universe wanted me to go this way. Like it's widespread in the public, and I, and it's like such a non-committal. Like what does that mean? The universe. Well, it's like saying Mother Earth. You know, God, God, Mother. God, yeah. because the earth is is made into a god the moon and the stars are made into gods in in all the 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 spiritual the spiritualist religions the new age religions but this oh. is even people who don't necessarily sorry my bad i'm just putting in my yeah well the the universe will provide well, yeah they say the universe will provide or yeah it's just become the term that everyone uses now yeah it's sort of it's i just don't like it yeah because they don't want people do not maybe god hasn't revealed himself to them you know we yeah i'm not I'm, I'm not a it's just that it, it's become like a popular yeah word. always and and among it, it, yeah it's you know it, it's i don't know doesn't yeah <laughs> You know, most of the pagan religions worship a god of death. If you look at the 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 cults of death, um, I, I see it in many of the religions. Even Halloween comes from that. There's um, uh, there's a lot of cruelty among pagan religions, and and our god wants us to know that he's a god of the living, and he wants us to choose life, not death. And when we follow him, he will give us life in so many ways that that are un, unexplicable. If we've lost everything, he will restore the years that the locust has eaten. There's, the promises in our Bible are, are incredible. And um, we just have to step by step, ask him to show us, show himself in our lives and and help us to walk with him and be obedient to him. So um, I hope that we, I've been able to bring a little bit of clarity to this portion. I know it's a long one. Most of them are not a, a double portion. Um, when we have a leap year, we, we're able to separate them because the Hebrew calendar had to coordinate itself with the Roman calendar in order to keep the, the holidays in their seasons, in the Roman calendar, <clears throat> a holiday will never be on the same day, the same time. But God gave us holidays, his holidays, seven of them. And the, he wants us to, um, to, uh, to observe them in their own season. And so that's why we, we go by the, uh, the lunar calendar. And so to, to, um balance the lunar with the solar sometimes we've had to add months to our calendar and um next week we will be looking at pinchas we we read a little bit about him today and um we're going to read a little more about him next week uh jerry are you ready to do the to end with the ironic benediction this is a a prayer that um, Aaron spoke, blessing uh, the children of Israel, and who consist of Jew and non-Jew. We are both incorporated into a, one body that worship the only God of Israel. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe. 
was sanctified Kohanim with the holiness of Aaron and commanded them to bless thy people Israel with love. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace. So shall they put my name, his name, upon the B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, and God will bless us. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Have a wonderful evening. We wish you a Shabbat Shalom, and God willing, we will see you next week when we read Pinchas. Yeah.